In this video, we are going to get into a little bit more detail of some things that we might want to do with the double data type. And we're going to explore that IPO model of let's get input for the user, let's perform some sort of process, and let's then output the results to the user uh, just a little bit more deeply. So what we're going to do here is not code something from scratch, but take a look at some examples uh, that I've already written and posted the code for online. So I'm here in the code, and what we're going to write today is we're going to write a program that calculates the rate of inflation of a particular product. So in particular, what we're going to do is we're going to look up some information about the cost of living in the year 2000, and we're going to see if the cost of things today seems to correspond to the rate of inflation, uh, what we would expect things to cost given their cost in the year 2000, and what we know about the rate of inflation. So here's a website where we have information about the, what things cost in the year 2000, like the cost of a gallon of gas or a loaf of bread. And we also have some information about the rate of inflation over time. We'll be focusing on these two rates of inflation right here, 2.56 and 2.29, which is describing the rate of inflation from 2000 onward, and then 2010, uh, we'll say, until the present. What we're going to do for simplicity's sake is just take that 2.56 to be our rate of inflation and assume that that's been the rate of inflation from 2000 to the present. So going back to the code, you'll notice that I have a couple of libraries loaded here. Let's talk about the formula we're going to be using first, and then we'll talk about those libraries. So I have the formula for the rate of inflation right here. It may remind you of this PERT formula or principle and rate times time sort of formula that you may have learned in a high school class. But the idea is we're going to have some sort of initial value. What did this thing originally cost? And we're going to peel that off of this table right here for some sort of object, be it a gallon of gas or a loaf of bread or a pound of coffee. We're then going to have this inflation rate, rate of inflation, R, right here. And we're going to have to have a time value as well. So we need to know these, not just one piece of information like we've seen before, but we need three pieces of information in order to be able to compute, given what the price of something was in the year 2000, what the rate of inflation is, and how many years it's been, what we expect the cost of that particular item to be today. So now we actually need three values in order to do this, and we have this formula. One thing that we discussed in class today is that even though I'm typing it this way in the comments, using a little caret to talk about exponentiation, C++ doesn't actually have a built-in power function as part of its typical language. However, there is this really great library called the CMath library that has a power function in it that we can call. And so when we get to that point, that's why this particular library, CMath, is loaded so that we can take powers inside of C++. We're also going to be dealing with something called set width and set precision, which is internally a double can represent many, many digits of accuracy of a decimal number. However, there's this default when we print something out to the screen that says you should print out something like six digits of that particular number. And when we're talking about money and what things cost, we very frequently would rather have two digits of precision to the right of the decimal place. And so we have the ability to change that default setting in C++ by using this set precision command. And that particular command lives in what's called the IOMANIP library. We want to manipulate the input output stream. So those are the three libraries we have loaded, our standard IO stream, CMath, so we can compute some powers, and IO manip, so that we can set C++ to show us only two decimal places uh, of accuracy. So we start with the input part of our IPO model. We tell the user in this line right here, I've got the lines numbered for you, so you can see, so in line 16, we just print to the user, welcome to our program, rate of inflation calculator. Then the first thing we do is say, all right, 
I want to get this thing that up here I called P. I want to get the initial cost of the item. So I'm going to come down here and I'm going to do three things. I'm going to first, in line 19, I'm going to declare a double variable called initial cost that I'm going to store that thing that I called P above in. So I declare the variable that I'm going to be using. I then print out to the user what I would like them to enter. Please enter the initial cost of the item. And I don't want them to print a dollar sign. I just want them to input the number. But that could be confusing to the user of the program. So I'm going to make sure I let them know. Let's not put a dollar sign there. Just give me the number. And then I'm going to read that in. So C in, remember, is go to the console and read in. I switch the little alligator mouths around. So they're pointing this direction. I say read that in. So lines 19, 20, and 21 declare where are we going to store this information that we want from the user. We're then going to ask the user for that information, and then we're going to read it in, and whatever value they give us will be stored in this variable that we can refer to later as initial cost. So that takes care of the P part of the formula that we're going to need. But at this point, we're not really done with our input process because we still need to ask the user for the rate of inflation and also the amount of time that we wish to consider. So we'll start this whole process over for the next variable, the declare prompt read in process for the number of years. I'm going a little out of order. You'll see why in a moment. So what we're going to do is we're going to declare a variable. It's going to have type double num years, and we're going to declare that data item, and then tell the user, please enter the number of years that you want to consider, and then we're going to read in that value. Now, what we're going to get to next is this D part of the IPO model, so you could call it the iPod model, although the D doesn't necessarily happen at the end, it happens throughout the program, and the D stands for data validation. And what that means is, is that I didn't have any real restrictions on the initial cost of an item, although generally we think of cost as a positive value or a non-negative value, I guess something could be free and cost nothing, I'm going to allow the user to enter a negative value if they want, because in theory we could use this program to talk about debt, and we could think of debt as being a negative value thing. If I have this debt and it's accruing interest at this rate over however many years, then this could still be a useful program for me. So really, even though I've called it initial cost, and I'm thinking about this for computing rates of inflation, I could put in any value that I want here, and this program would still make sense. However, I really don't want to think about a number of years elapse as being a negative thing. And so when I tell the user, please enter in the number of years that you wish to consider, I'd like to think that the user of the program is going to follow those directions, but maybe for whatever reason they don't, and they enter some sort of negative number like negative three years. I don't want to proceed with the program and do any kind of computation if it happens to be the case that the user has given me bad data. And so what I need to do is I need some sort of mechanism for checking what the user has passed me for a number of years. And if they've passed me a bad number, then I want to ask them to enter it in again. And I don't want to do that process just once. I want my computer program to be more stubborn than the user of the program. So, for example, if somebody entered negative three years and I said, no, no, that's not good, please try again, and stubbornly again they entered negative three years, I wouldn't want to allow them continue as long as they're going to stubbornly enter data that doesn't make sense. So my mechanism for doing that is what's called a while loop. The structure is, I use this C++ reserve word while that appears here at line 30, and I give it some sort of condition to check. The check is, if it happens to be the case that the data that they've given me is bad, so at this point I've said, here is a variable number of years, 
the user has one time entered in number of years. The next thing that's going to be executed by the program is line 30. It's going to check that value that is now stored in number of years that was passed to me by the user in line 26. Is that value less than zero? If so, I want to execute this block of command in the program, all of the things that are inside these braces. I want to execute this process. I want to say to the user, that's not a valid number of years. What you just entered is a bad number of years. What's a good number of years? The number of years has to be at least 0.0. .0. So I tell them what the problem is with the data that they've input, and then I ask them again, just like I asked them up here, please enter the number of years. And again, read that in. So this is what I want to do if the data is bad. I want to tell them that there was a problem. I want to then have them tell them what I'd like them to do and read in a new value to be stored in number of years. I want to do all of that while this condition fails. So supposing that the user entered in negative three years right here, then it would be true that negative 3 is less than 0, 0.0. And so when the program reaches line 30, it will say, yes, this statement evaluates to true here. And therefore, I want to execute this chunk of code. When I reach line 36, the user has entered in some new number of years. And when I reach this bracket, 37, the flow of control is going to go right back up to line 30. So it's not going to proceed to line 38 like you might expect it to. It's going to return to line 30, and it's going to say, now I have this new value in number of years, whatever the user entered the second time around, and I'm going to check again. At this point, if the user was very stubborn and entered negative 3 again, we'll enter this block of code and execute it one more time. And as long as the user keeps entering in data that's bad, negative 3, negative 5, negative 14.9, we will continually execute lines 31 through 37 all over again. And as soon as the user enters in a value like 0 or 18 or 5, then when we get to this process, number of years being something like 5, it will not be true that 5 is less than 0, 0.0, and so if this expression evaluates to false, then that's our condition to know, okay, we can now proceed to line 38 of the code, we can skip this part, we have good data, and we can continue on. So to see what that looks like, let's actually run this program. So we want to run the program, it welcomes us. It says, enter the initial cost of the item without a dollar sign. So let's enter something like $1.72, I believe was the cost of a loaf of bread. And here is where we've reached that chunk, line 30 in the code. Actually, at this point, we're at line 25 in the code. Please enter the number of years, and it's the program is waiting for me respond with my number of years. So notice that if I'm good and I enter 5 right away from my number of years and hit enter, I never get any of this code that's happening in lines 30 through 37. I never get this statement, the number of years must be at least 0. That didn't appear for me. I've moved on to the next part of the code which is asking me for the rate of inflation. However, if I come in, say $1.72 to the code, and then I enter negative 3, it says the number of years must be at least 0, 0.0. Please enter the number of years. And I can do this, enter negative 3, as many times as I want, and the program will continue to execute that code inside this block right here so that it will never ever let me go past line 37 until I play nicely and enter a good value like 18 and then it moves on to the next part of the program lines 38 and beyond.
Right. So that's the data validation portion of this iPod model. Now we can go a little bit quicker through the rest of the program. Assuming we've gotten some good data from our user, we now have the P portion, our initial value, and we have our time portion. And for each of those things, we've thought about, do we need to check our data or not? And if so, let's check to make sure that that data is okay. The very last bit of information that we need is R. Even though it comes second in this equation, I've saved it for last. I followed the declare it prompt, obtain it, double rate of inflation, see out, please enter the yearly rate of inflation as a percentage. And again, I'm telling the user, don't actually put the percent sign in there, just tell me what the percent is. Something along the lines of 3.4, 0, 50, whatever it might be. And I read in that rate of inflation. The reason that I saved this variable for last to be gotten from the user is that checking for good data here is again something that we should do. And we really want this percentage to be a percentage. That is, we want the number that the user has entered to be something in between zero and a hundred. So just like we did before with the time mechanism, we need to put a statement inside the parentheses on this while loop that says what kind of data would be bad for us. And so what would be bad for us is just like in the case of number of years, we don't think about negative percentages. So just like we had for number of years, if we had rate of inflation less than 0.0, .0 that would be bad. And so that's the first part of this clause. But there's another way for a rate to be bad, and that's for it to be a percentage that's larger than 100. So one way for data to be bad is for that rate of inflation to be less than 0, 0.0, and another way for that rate to be bad is for that rate of inflation to be larger than 100. So if either of those things goes wrong, if this is wrong, or if this is wrong, so remember that the two vertical lines is a statement for or. If either of these two things happen, then I've got some bad data and I want to prompt the user, tell them what they've done wrong, tell them what I'm looking for, and read in that data again, not allowing the code to execute past line 53 this time, as long as they've given me something that's bad in either one of the two ways that could be bad. So let's test that out and let's ensure that this chunk of code is getting executed properly if we want run our program. So we run our program. We're going to enter in $1.72 for the initial cost of the item. We're going to be looking at things over an 18 year time span. And now what we want to do is enter in our rate of inflation. We saw before that the rate of inflation we were going to be using was, was 2.56. But let's think about entering bad data. And bad data would either be some sort of negative number, like negative 3. And so when we enter something like negative 3, bad data, we expect to get inside this block of code with the while loop that tells us we have bad data and asks us to try again. And sure enough, when I enter negative 3, the program says the rate of inflation must be between 0 and 100. You haven't entered something with that property, so let's try again. Please enter the yearly rate of inflation as a percentage. So negative 3 was bad, and I can keep entering negative 3, and it won't let me continue. But similarly, I can enter 101, and it's not going to let me continue with 101 either. And no matter what I do between those values, it won't let me go on until I go ahead and enter in something good like 2.56. And then you can see that my program does something else. That concludes the input portion of this program, which is actually very much of all of the work that needs to be done. We're now ready to start the process portion of this IPO model, iPod model. And the first thing that we have to do is a step that we need to use this formula that 
we need to translate from how the user is thinking to how this formula actually works. So this is the thing we do all the time. We talk about percentages like 2.54%, but when we work with them numerically, we don't actually want a value from 0 to 100. We want a value in between 0 and 1. So what we do is if we wanted to think about 2.56% as a numerical value to do computations with, we'd really be thinking about that as 0.0256%. And so we'd be moving that decimal place over two spaces. In other words, what we're doing is dividing by 100. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take rate of inflation, and what I want it to be is what it already is divided by 100. So this is a kind of strange looking statement here at line 58 because I have rate of inflation twice. So here's another example. We've seen a couple examples, both with order of operations and now with these while loops, where the flow of control of the program doesn't always read left to right and doesn't always read one line in a row. Sometimes your flow of control can go from line 53 back up to line 48 and so on and so forth. Here's another example. What's actually happening in line 58 when I have rate of inflation equals rate of inflation divided by 100, the assignment of taking the value and storing it in the rate of inflation spot is being done after the computation. So we're not starting right here in the code. In line 58, the code actually begins to execute right here. So it takes whatever value is in rate of inflation, like 2.56, and it does the division first, divides it by 100, and that just turns into a numerical value. So the computer starts here, it goes to the rate of inflation spot where it's storing that, and it looks up that that number is 2.56. It then does the arithmetic computation of dividing that by 100, and it gets this number 0 0.0256. And once it just has this total number 0 0.0256 here, it changes what's inside rate of inflation from 2.56 to 0 0.0256. So the code looks a little funny, but what this is really saying is take the value that you currently have, change it in this way, and then update the value rate of inflation, all in one line. The very next line is the end of the process portion. We just have two lines of code, and that is to go back up to the top and look at that formula that we have and actually compute it. We have our initial value, we then compute 1 plus the rate of inflation raised to the number of years that we have looking here. And we do that by calling this power command, which is just indicated as pow. And the way the power command works is, first of all, you have to have that CMath library loaded. But then what you do is you say pow, open parentheses, what your base is, that's our 1 plus our rate, and what your exponent is, that's our number of years. So right here, I am going to compute 1 plus the rate of inflation to the number of years power. This is going to be executed first, actually. Function calls, which is what we're doing, calling the power function, get executed before any kind of multiplication. I need a value to put right here before I can do this multiplication, initial cost times this value. So this is where the flow of control starts. It starts with calling the power function and computing a number, which is 1 plus the rate of inflation raised to the number of years power. And once I have a number for that, I will multiply it by initial cost, and then I will store that in this new double that I've created called inflated cost. And that concludes the process portion, those two lines right there. The very last bit, which I'll leave you to think about since this video is already plenty long, is we've got to do the output. And what the output is going to do is print out to the screen all sorts of different things. Let's run our program. $1.72, 18 years, and 2.56%. So what our program is doing is computing what should 
a loaf of bread cost today, given that a loaf of bread costs $1.72 in the year 2000. And it tells us an item costing $1.72 at this rate of inflation for 18 years will cost this much money. This first line right here that's print out to the console is when I haven't done anything at all in the code. I just said, print everything you have. Tell me what an item costs, what the rate of inflation is. Tell me what you think the initial cost is, the rate of inflation, the number of years, and then what this total cost ought to be. Tell me what that is. And so what you can see is what I mentioned at the beginning of this program. What the program wants to do is show me six decimal places of accuracy. But none of those things makes any particular sense given that we're dealing with dollars. We would really much, very much like to see two decimal places of precision. And so what I've done is I've called the set precision function. And I call it one time, set precision, parentheses two, and then it will now print those every single one of those variables that follows the set precision two to only two digits of accuracy. So that's what you're seeing right down here, an item costing $1.72 at this rate of inflation for 18 years will cost $2.71. And if you want to look around more at the code that's posted again on eLearning, you can see the variations in each one of these lines, what I've done to make this an 18 years instead of an 18.00 years. It's very lengthy, but that concludes our discussion of all things iPod related in terms of that programming acronym and finishes up anything we have to say about uh, the double data type.